Good evening, everyone. I hope everybody can hear me just fine. Um, thank you for joining us on this uh, Monday evening, this hot Monday evening here in Buffalo. Um, and thanks for joining our cybersecurity educational session. Um, this session, uh, in a minute, I'm going to have Dave Newell from Lopter join us, and we're going to have an open-ended discussion about some things that uh, we think that individuals in their homes should really be interested in uh, talking about keeping themselves secure and making sure that their networks and their security is up to speed. Um, so first, let me start by introducing Dave. So Dave Newell is a longtime consultant and entrepreneur, and Dave founded Lobster in 2013. He's the CEO and founder to make it easier for organizations to get their information security processes done. His belief was that with the right building blocks and a helping hand, even client teams without security expertise could have a working information security program. Full disclosure, we use Dave's services to make sure that Level Financial Advisors and our network um, and all of our equipment is secure, our firewall, and they do a, they do a fantastic uh, job for us. Dave is a highly sought after guest lecturer on college campuses and an established security expert who is presented to many national organizations. Dave is a former U.S. Air Force officer who served in the Pentagon's seventh communication group and he is previously co-founded Brave Technology in Denver, Colorado. He earned his bachelor's in computer systems and mathematics. Little, little couple, couple of facts about Dave too that we're adding to the bio. Uh, Dave is a sometime mountain biker and a top eight goalkeeper in East Aurora's eight team over 30 summer league. So he's a coach and a board member for Aurora Arsenal Soccer Club, which serves about a thousand kids and adults in Western New York. So with that, what we're gonna do here is I see more people filtering into to our talk is uh, Dave and I have developed some talking points. Um, and, and instead of doing a traditional PowerPoint presentation, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna stop the screen share and we're going to just have a conversation and talk about some things that we think might be important. Um, so Dave, we're gonna, we're gonna kick it right off here. The first thing that I think we'd like to ask is what can individuals do to protect their computer assets at home? I'm thinking of things like patches and antivirus and malware bytes, uh, malware software uh, systems. So what are some of the things that individuals can do uh, right in their own home to protect their computer assets? Yeah, uh, that's a great lead off question, I suppose, for us. And um, um, I, think, <clears throat> I think one of the things that's true, you know, we work with small and medium sized businesses primarily, um, but a lot of the things that we tell our clients to do are actually the same things that we need to do as individuals. Um, and so one of them, you actually, uh, well, you actually listed already, and that is uh, patching software or updating software. And so at home, what that means is, you know, most of us use, the majority of us probably use Windows. Um, and some of us use uh, Macs, so we're running Mac OS instead of Windows. Uh, some of us have a mix of Windows and Macs. And then on our mobile devices, we're using iPhones and Android. And all of those need updates. And so one of the key things that we need to do is to make sure that we update that software. Um, at home, like if it comes to Windows and Macs, um, really all you have to do is configure those systems to automatically do updates. And so both Windows, Mac OS, have a setting that we can use to automatically apply updates. And that's the first piece of it. And it's, it's the easy part because it's just checking a box, right, in the settings. The second part, which is a little bit harder, is actually allowing the updates when the system tells you it has updates. And so a lot of us, what we end up doing is the message comes up and it tells us that we need to apply updates. And then we're like, not right now. And so then we click the ignore and we'll ignore it. 
we'll say, oh, do it tonight. And then we turn off the computer so it doesn't do it tonight. And then we do it tomorrow and we don't do it then. And so one of the things that tends to happen is we tend to take longer than we should to apply those updates. Um, what we need to do is we need to apply those updates pretty quickly. Um, what I tell people is actually the way I do it at home is um, when a new version of iOS comes out for my phone, what I do is I let my kids do the update first and then I check with them to see if it works. <laughs> and then if it make, make sure it doesn't break their computers first. Is that what you're exactly. doing? Exactly. So okay. yeah, so you you know, use them as their as your test cases. So sure. if their iPhone updates fine, if their Mac or Windows computer updates fine, then you know it's okay to do it for yours. Um, these days those really most of the updates work just fine um, first pass. So what, what we tend to do is we tend to think that we have more time, but really we should be updating within a few days of a new release coming out. Yeah, because uh, the mere existence of the update usually means that they've discovered, I know with Windows, I'm a Windows user, I know that if they've discovered a problem or some type of potential vulnerability, they're pushing out a patch pretty quickly. And it goes out to yeah. the, goes goes out to the users. Uh, one thing I think I want to mention or get your opinion on um, when it comes to Windows specifically, and I'm not sure a lot of users know this, but Windows Seven, for example, no longer supported, right? No more security patches, correct. no more updates. Yeah, security nerds call that end of life. So Windows Seven is end of life. It is no longer being updated. So you should not be using Windows 7. You also should go with Windows 95. <laughs> if, I actually saw Windows 95 the other day and I couldn't believe it. But so Windows 95, Vista, Windows 7, um, I think there's a Windows 8 out there somewhere too, which was yeah, a, a, yeah. A, uh, so it really should be at this point in the evolution of things, it should be Windows 10. Yeah, um, that's, that's right. The, so for users that have computers at home, and a lot of a lot of users that have old old computers, you know, five, six, seven years old that were installed with Windows Seven Professional, that is no longer getting security updates. So those computers are potentially at risk um, to cyber hackers. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and you know one of the things that's tough about that is even if you're following the news, and you are aware that there's an update that comes out for Windows Ten. Um, those fix, there's never going to be a fix for Windows 7. And so you're running software that just is exposed. And so because of that, you know, they're just, you will be very vulnerable. And that, and that actually, um, you know, so patching is, is kind of like the key thing that we're going to go to first as a thing that you need to do. Um, a, a second point, though, is kind of like related to that, and that is replacing old stuff. So um, the replacing old stuff does kind of have to do with computers when you think about things like, um, you know, your old iPhone won't necessarily run the latest version of um, iOS. And so right. at a certain point, and you know, I mean, I feel bad about it. The con as a device, it's still perfectly fine. But as a security guy, I have to say, you, you have to replace it because Apple won't uh, update iPhones or Macs after a certain period of time. And it's, it's years, you know, and it's the same with, uh, with Microsoft and with Android. At a certain point, you have to replace those devices. But as much as we talk about computers and operating systems, it actually also applies to your wireless network and your home router. So if you've got a computer that you've been, or excuse me, a, a wireless router, this, this network device that connects to your um, Fios or free, to your Spectrum, and if those devices are really more than probably five years old, you really just need to replace them. Um, right, right. At a certain so, point, what happens is the vendors just don't update them anymore, but the bad guys can still be trying to hack into them. Yeah, and so for example, um, I know uh, having recently moved into a new home and I got uh, Spectrum, um, they provide, uh, you get the modem and then they provide the wireless device and they recommend that you use their wireless device. And that's the most recent, recent version. And they're doing um, firmware updates to that software on an automatic basis. And so um, those are updated. But if you have at your home 
an, a wireless device that's six years old and um, you're, you've had it on your network and it's worked fine, you could potentially be exposing your system. Um, and one thing I wanna to mention too, but that I didn't mention at the beginning of this uh, conversation, I wanna make sure that everybody listening knows um, that there is the ability um, to ask questions. Um, even throughout the presentation, you can use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of the screen um, and we'll get your questions to Dave. And then at the end, we're going to leave plenty of time for questions because I'm sure um, that individuals have questions about maybe some, some things that we didn't mention. Um, so, so Dave, you, you talked about Wi-Fi, how we can make it more secure. Hardware is one of them. Um, what are some other things people can do when it comes to Wi-Fi to make their home networks um, a little more secure than the average average user? Yeah, so, um, you know, in, in a way, the simplest thing you can do is not use an old Wi-Fi device. So that, that still does apply. Um, so, you know, what you should really be looking for is if the wireless router, the wireless access point that you're using isn't... Um, is more than a few years old, it might be worthwhile for you to update it. And one of the things that does happen is uh, the Wi-Fi devices just get faster and they support more. And you know, so as, as we're streaming more in our homes, the performance side of it is worth it. So at the risk of sounding like I'm trying to sell people wireless devices, I guess, um, <laughs> there, there's a lot to be said for actually running a newer wireless device if you do a lot of internet at home. Um, but yeah. what, what it will do is it will bring you a more secure device as well. Um, so other than that, you should run, you should be using encryption. Um, if you've been using wireless for long enough, um, you know, 15 years ago, wireless had some real security problems in terms of the way the encryption worked, but those have really been fixed by now. So the basic things that you probably want to do with your wireless network are one, to use a long passphrase. So use the password that you use to keep people from accessing your wireless network, make it long and hard to guess. Don't what do you that. recommend? Let's touch on that just for a second. What do you recommend when it comes to length of password, but also the types of passwords um, that individuals should use? Yeah. All right. And so, you know, so that is a, that's a great question. And, and let me, let me kind of, jump from talking about wireless passwords. So, you know, the wireless password, there's a password that you set for your wireless access point and that controls, everybody shares it. Everybody who has access um, uses that same password. Um, and the other thing for you to think about before I talk about passwords, but thinking about wireless is the idea of creating a guest network. So if the wireless access point that you're using at home allows you to create separate networks. What you can do is you can create your home network that your family uses, and then you can create a separate guest network. And the guest network won't give access to your home devices, but it will allow people to come in, connect to the guest network, and then use the internet. So if you have a wireless device that allows that, set up a separate guest network and use that. Um, okay, now back to passwords. Um, this, will this will apply to uh, the password that you might set as your shared password, but it's actually good uh, advice for all of your passwords on the internet. And so it's basically, it's the way that I set all of my passwords. And I'm going to tell you how I set my passwords. And despite that, I have no fear that you're going to guess any of my passwords. Okay, we're we're going to get ready to write down all your password secrets. <laughs> that's exactly right. So, <laughs> so you the use formula, the same password for everything. <laughs> that is that is absolutely... Don't do that. That's right. That is, that, is, that is Mike's joke about how to set a bad password. But yeah, so basically there are a couple of things you want to do is you want to set a different password on all of your systems. And people tend to hear that and think that there's no way that they could do that because you couldn't memorize all of those. But that's also a piece of bad advice that, that you've been getting for years. So there's this bad advice is we go in and say, look, you should make a complex password and then it should be, um, and then you shouldn't write it down. That's the bad part. What you should do is make a unique password. It should be different on all of their systems. And the other thing you should do is you should make it long it turns out that complexity doesn't matter. So we've tended to see these passwords that are eight characters long and they're like capital X, lowercase a, exclamation point, 
um, two, and then A, and then big X, and then period, and then four. And you're like, I can't even remember that. And I just said it because it did end with a four. I remember that part of it. But the rest of it, like, you can't remember it because it isn't designed to be memorable. But we actually sometimes do need to remember what our passwords are. So what you should do is make your passwords longer and you should get password management software. And you should store your passwords in the password management software designed to be secure. You'll have one great password that you use for that. And then that makes it easier for you to get to the other passwords that you need to use. So password management software, the, the software I use and my company uses is called LastPass. I'm not, mm -hmm. you know, there are lots of yeah. other products out there. They're, they're well known. I mean, we use a product called Dashlin. Yeah. Um, which is uh, a good software that we use in our, in our, we actually require all of our employees to use Dashlin. Yeah. And we um, like one little trick that people can do. And I've seen this time and time again is um, people will write down their passwords and then they'll put them in the desk drawer right next to their computer. And then someone breaks into their house and they got, <laughs> they got all the passwords to their computer. Yeah. So the big, the big no-no here is do not write down your passwords. They right. go into that encrypted software package like you have in Dashlin. Um, and so you're recommending that you use something longer that's memorable, more like a passphrase of some kind, but yeah. not too uh, easy to figure out, obviously. Exactly. Yeah, so my formula, um, which I promised I'd tell you, was um, I usually use three or four words. Usually I use three. So three words and a number. So usually a three or four digit number. So it could be like um, uh, globe, glasses, um, and planter. So globe, glasses, planter, that could be my, um, uh, my three words. And if you weren't paying attention, you saw me looking around the room as I found globe, globe glasses, and planter. And so part of that is, I know that this is a password that I might need to use. I can look around and I can kind of see these things and say, oh, it's globe glasses planter. And then I'll combine a two or three digit number with that. So let's just say 3003. So I've got globe glasses planter 3003. What I'll do is I'll put the number in a different place. So it might be globe glasses 3003 planter. And that's my basic password, all lowercase and then four numbers. And then what I do is I misspell one of the words. And so I'll go and say globe glasses 3003 planter, but I'll rem remove the E from planter. And so what happens is you've made a password that's really long. That's probably like 25 characters or so, but the lack, the, this misspelling makes it ridiculously difficult for hackers to crack. And so even if they got your encrypted password, it would take them trillions of years to actually crack that password. Still, right. if I was, if I was, you know, if I had to type it in, I could be like globe glasses 3003 planter. And I can remember that long enough to type it in if I have to. And right. um, the uppercase, lowercase punctuation, none of that matters. Just with lowercase and those numbers, and then a misspelling, Literally, it is trillions of years for a hacker to crack that password. Yeah, and so, you know, of course, and we, we probably should mention, too, that a couple of other things with passwords, since we're just talking about them, um, you know, one of the things that we measure in our business is um, how often people are using passwords multiple times, same password for five different websites, for example. Big no-no, obviously, because if somebody gets the password to one through some other type of data breach, maybe not even your fault, they could start applying that password to other things that you're known to be involved in. Um, so we always recommend different password for everything, um, mix it up a little bit to make sure and keep an eye on compromised uh, websites. So the nice thing about some of these softwares are they'll tell you what, uh, what websites have been compromised and if your credentials were on there, um, you know, you want to change that credential. And obviously if you're using the same one multiple times, you want to go and change all those too. So, right. right. Okay, good. So, um, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, let's talk about what you're seeing as far as the most common types 
of cyber attacks that these days, I mean, they're all different types, but what are the most common types of cyber attacks that individuals are experiencing from what you see now? I mean, know businesses can maybe have a little bit of a different uh, flavor, but what do you, what are you seeing out there in the landscape? Yeah. Yeah. So probably like, <clears throat> probably the biggest attack is, um, is phishing. So just straight up that that's it. So um, let's make sure before we go further on that, you know, because you never know, uh, somebody might not have heard of that term before. So can you explain phishing real quick and what it is and, and, and what it looks like? And yeah. Yeah. And you know, the first thing to do is to spell it right. So it's, 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 uh, it's not a uh, phishing attack where I'm attacking people with fish. It is um, <laughs> throwing fish at them. It is, um, uh, it's spelled P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G. And so what phishing is, is an email-based attack. It is when a bad actor, a hacker, sends an email to you trying to trick you into doing something. So in a phishing attack, it is, um, there's a handful of things that they might be doing. Basic phishing attack, click on this link. <clears throat> so you'll see this email and it will uh, send a link to you and you're supposed to click on the link. If you click on the link, then it can take you to a website that the hacker controls and the hacker will typically try to get you to either, well, one of the things they'll try to do is they'll try to get you to um, <clears throat> download a file or the software on the website might actually try to compromise your computer, just taking advantage of a vulnerability in case you hadn't been patching your computer. Um, another thing that they might do is you might click on this link, which might then pretend to be a Dropbox page or a Microsoft page or a Google page, and it'll ask for your username and password. And it might look very similar to say your Gmail login, and it might ask for your username and password. If you plug in your email address, your password, then they've stolen their, your password from you. So the phishing attacks have a few different techniques in terms of how they work, but they're all based on an email that comes to you and pretends to be somebody that, um, usually there's a trust involved with this. So this kind of is, is the key reason why phishing attacks work. As far as I'm concerned, the reason that they work is because evolutionary, we humans have learned that working together and trusting people is part of the way that we survive, right? So that understanding that if somebody comes to you, you know, they come into, I don't know, you're all living around your, your cave and somebody comes rushing to you and says, you know, the lions are coming, we all need to run. You trust them and we all run into the woods, climb up trees and escape from the lions, right? <laughs> so right. now it's a different thing, but you, but you know, this kind of idea that we trust people is, is just, it's built into our DNA now. And so folks send us emails and when they do, what they're doing is they're taking advantage of that trust. Sometimes they're doing that by pretending to be Starbucks and saying, hey, I'm Starbucks and you can trust me because see how there's a Starbucks logo here? I must be Starbucks. And then they, they offer you a uh, free latte and all you have to do is click here. And the next thing you know, you're clicking on a link that you shouldn't have clicked on. Um, or they're pretending to be your financial advisor and they are sending you an email saying, hey, this is your financial advisor and I need you to send me some important information. And right. that's something we would call that business email compromise. And that happens to businesses a lot, but it can happen to individuals as well. And when it does, basically it's the thing that makes it tricky is the hacker doesn't actually try to compromise your computer at all. They just try to get you to do something that isn't in your best interest. They try to get you right. to change an account setting or to send information or uh, to change a bank account, you know? So they're trying to get you to do something that you really shouldn't do. Um, and they'll do that by pretending to be somebody that you know, um, or sometimes, you know, they, they don't even try very hard. Sometimes they can't trick you, but um, a lot of times that is, they can trick you, but, but they're not even trying, like they won't even find somebody that's related to you. Um, and so that's kind of a business email compromise. But thinking back to phishing, another thing that will happen is a bad actor can get access to the account of somebody that you know. And uh, we actually saw this with, with some of our clients. Um, one of our clients got um, three days apart, they actually got 
two different emails from two different law firms, one in Texas and one in Florida, that um, their, one of their employees in each case is, had had their accounts compromised. And so the, the hackers got into these law firms accounts and then started sending emails to um, other people that they wanted to compromise. And so they just sent this email. And in one case, it was um, asking for information. And in another case, it was open this file. This relates to a uh, court case. Um, they weren't particularly specific. They didn't name who they were. There was no relationship with the law firm, but it was creating a sense of urgency and it was coming from a legitimate person. So what, what happens for us is when we see a phishing attack like this, we'll do an investigation. We actually contacted each of the law firms and talked to them about what had happened to make sure that they knew that one of their accounts had been compromised. Um, but it's tricky because when you look at it, even if you looked up, um, in, one, in one case, it came from a paralegal. And if you looked her up, she was a real person. It was a real law firm. Um, the law firm checked out. It wasn't a fake address. It was just that it had been hacked. Yeah, and so um, one of the things that we teach here with our with our employees, and but this this uh, applies certainly applies to home, is that when you when you receive something via email, the first question you should probably ask yourself, especially if it comes from something like, "Hey, it looks like my financial advisor," or "It looks like my bank," or "It looks like Starbucks," is was I expecting this email? And if the answer to that question is no, then there's some things you can do inside of that email to tell if it's not legitimate. So for example, you can hover over the link in the email to see if it's actually going to an address that's affiliated with the person that's sending you. So if, if for example, Level Financial Advisors sent one of our clients an email to their uh, personal email address with a link to our share file upload site. It would be very clear if you hovered over that link that it would say level FA sharefile.com. A lot of times you can tell just by looking at the link that it's about to send you to some nefarious location that has nothing to do with anything you were just talking about. Um, so that, that's certainly one thing that we teach. Um, what are some other things that people can do to just guard against that type of, of phishing attack? Yeah. All right, so I think, you know, so one of the things that you bring up there is like I talked about trusting. And so, so part of that point is when it comes to phishing attacks is in, in particular, no, actually when it comes to pretty much all of the frauds that we could talk about, because it's not just phishing, but when it comes to that, it's, it's really, we need to trust less, but obviously to continue to live our lives, we have to be able to trust. So it's really kind of like a trust, but verify. Right. Yeah, a healthy and, skepticism. <laughs> yeah. And so when you think about when you think about the way that the processes that you should have, and I'm and, and you know, these are processes that you would have in place at level, but from an individual perspective, if somebody's asking you to do a thing, you should think about verifying that ask. Right. And so part of what happens, uh, I'll, I'll I'm going to have to slip into like the geek speak a little bit, I guess. But <laughs> what we do is we talk about doing an out of band verification. And what we mean is don't use the same mechanism. If somebody sends right. you an email and says, I need you to change the account that, that you sent something to. We had a client who um, their HR person got a request from their CEO to their their CEO <laughs> to request to change his direct deposit. Right. And so in that case, you know, there was no chance that that was going to happen due to the lack of familiarity that the language for it um, and all the training that went into it. But the ask was, hey, I need you to change my direct deposit because I'm, I don't know, on vacation and something. And so in this case, what you can't do is you can't send an email back and say, hey, before I do this, can you verify it? Because you'd be sending an email to potentially to the to the bad actor. Right. So exactly. in those cases, what you want to do is use a phone number. Well, you can't use the phone number that they just sent you, but you should have the phone number of your CEO or of your financial advisor. So in cases of money, what you need to do is you need to go in and say, look, this is something where before I do this, they sent me a text. I'm going to follow up with 
an email or they sent me an email, I'm gonna follow up with a, with a phone call, right? So using different mechanisms to verify it. Yeah. And these days, I think it's too easy for us to just focus on electronic communications and not pick up the phone. Sometimes the best thing for us to do is just to check in and make sure that A, we know how you're doing and then B, you're, you know, something evil isn't going on. Uh, so when it comes to, okay, so we talked a little about fishing, obviously fishing is very common. It's, it's the least pass, path of resistance for a lot of hackers. What are some of the other things you're seeing out there um, on the cyber attack front? Individual. Yeah, yeah. So we're seeing a little bit of an uh, uptick in in what we call smishing, which is S M I S smishing S M I S H, and it's basically those are text messages that are they act like fishes, but they're text messaging. For some reason, somebody seems to think I must be a vapor because I'm getting a lot of vaping smishes lately. Maybe everybody is, but um, but what will happen is they'll send you this this short. URL within a text message. Those are evil too. So you can't click on those. So you, so the tough thing now is we can't trust a lot of things. And I'm sure everybody has heard via a phone call that their extended car warranty is about to expire and they should, you know, they should, they should, they, they need to buy that. Right. And so that'll happen a lot. And so those are basically, it's easy to make fun of those because they should be pretty easy to spot but they're happening a lot. And so there are a certain number of people that must be clicking on the unsolicited link that comes in a text message or the phone call that they didn't ask for that comes to them. So part yeah. of that is, so, so those are similar to phishing. What you have to do is you just have to be healthily skeptical about them. And then probably along with that is like the tech support scam, which we've seen a lot. And this is actually something that targets consumers more than companies. And so with a tech support scam, it will be either a phone call or it will be a message that comes in a pop-up. And so in this case, what can happen is if you've been to, if your browser, you know, if you browse to a new website and you get, uh, your browser can get infected by adware. And so what the bad actors will do is they'll inject pop-ups. Sometimes even if you don't get infected, you'll see this pop-up that says, hey, you need to contact Microsoft or McAfee or whatever, because um, your computer has been infected by, by viruses. Um, the thing that happens is this will tend to be something that appears in your web browser. It's not your antivirus software actually warning you. It is your browser, but a hacker is pretending to be antivirus software. And a lot of times the giveaway for this is it's a warning from software that you don't use, you know? So you're using Malwarebytes and this is a warning from Windows Defender. You're using a Mac and it's a warning from Windows Defender. You know, there's, there should be some giveaways, but the key thing is these are popping up from your, uh, from your, in your web browser. One of the other things I sometimes say is this, is um, when it comes to tech support from Microsoft contacting you, contacting you because you have a problem, the deal is actually Microsoft doesn't care. So that's right. kind of what we tell our clients is. They're, they're never going to contact you proactively. <laughs> right. And, and actually, we are a Microsoft business customer. I, a few years ago, Microsoft called us. Um, and we have, we have four, different four different consultants who are all set up as administrators because of the way we use Microsoft. So Microsoft started calling every one of them. And we were just we were giving them a ton of grief. There was no way we were going to believe that it was actually Microsoft. And they were emailing us. They were calling us. Nobody would talk to them because we know how much of a scam it can be. So, right. but, but the bottom line for us as consumers is tech support people aren't contacting you to let you know you have a problem. They can't do it. They're just not monitoring you that way. So if anybody ever tells you this is Microsoft and you need to do something, just assume that they're lying to you. Yes, right, exactly. See, because it, it's it's definitely it's it's a giveaway for sure. Um, we do have a, a, a question that popped up, um, so I'll take a quick pause here. Um, this question uh, says, "I'm a Mac user, not Windows, so Apple iOS. Apple updates the operating system every few years. How soon after an update is it safe to download?" to avoid a buggy system. The question relates to Windows 10 update recommendation a bit earlier. So it's more, more of a Mac question, but obviously mm -hmm. Mac, um, uh, 
Apple has had some issues with some of its <clears throat> um, upgrades. Yeah. Oh yeah, and you know, Apple's are Apple computers are targeted by hackers. It's just kind of like uh, historically they've been targeted less, and part of that is because more people use Windows. Um, and then the other part is actually, um, you know, especially historically, um, OS 10 has been more secure. And um, I, the, there's a point where this starts to feel like a religious argument. But what I can tell you is we're a Mac shop. We use Macs as well. Um, so I'm speaking to you from a Mac and um, I use a, an iPhone. So um, that, you know, that's the ecosystem that we use as a company. And definitely for, for most folks, if they ask, I'll recommend using a, you know, if you're worried about security and you can afford to um, use a Mac because they tend to be attacked less um, and there are fewer pieces of malware for them. Um, but that wasn't the question. The question really was about how frequently you should update. So what I do again is I'll, I'll let my son do an update before I do when I can. But <laughs> Dave, that's <it's> terrible. <laughs> I, you know, I, I mean, that's, that's why I had kids, I'm pretty sure. Um, but uh, uh, what I usually do for iPhones is I'll update my iPhone within two or three days of an update. Um, and I'll do my, um, I have a, an iPad. And so I'll do the iPad first and then an iPhone. I'm not saying that everybody should buy an iPad so that they can have a two-phase update. But if you think about it, if you do one device, check and make sure that it works and then do, do the next would be okay. Um, so that's kind of like, uh, but two to three days, usually within that period of time, if there was a problem, then you're going to have heard about it. Um, for my Macs, I'll go, I'll usually wait until the next Friday, you know? So I'm just like, I like to, and then the other thing uh, that I could have mentioned earlier, which is how do I protect home, home assets? That piece of it, another important thing is doing backups. So for me, I'll do backups of my, uh, my Mac um, weekly. So I'll just do a backup straight before I do an update. So if you do that, you can always uh, restore it from that backup as well. But I'm usually like, uh, I'm like a Friday night updater for my Mac. Okay. Here's, a, here's another quick question. It's just actually something I wanted to ask. It just kind of came to mind now. What's your opinion on all these home devices that are attached to your network. So you've got, I mean, I'm just looking around my house. I got ring, I got uh, fire sticks. My dishwasher is connected to my network. It sends a message to my phone when the dishes are cleaned. Um, what's, your, what's your professional opinion on all these uh, connected devices and what they do to networks? Yeah, well, I do use some smart devices myself. So I'm not uh, hiding in a cave trying to avoid smart devices. But um, in our corporate office, one of the things that we do is we have four different networks. And one of them is our Internet of Things network. And so all of our uh, smart devices are actually connected to a separate network. Um, and earlier I had mentioned that when you're setting up a wireless network at home, a good thing to do is to have your home network and then your guest network. And what you could do if you have a device that supports that, you could actually connect your IoT devices to your guest network. And then that keeps them away from your computers. Yeah, um, so that's, that's a really probably a really smart thing for you to do. And, so you kind and of when, have... you say, when you say different network, um, if somebody, for example, let's say somebody had a, uh, they got a Spectrum mo uh, modem and they got the Spectrum Wi-Fi device, and maybe they got their own Linksys uh, uh, Wi-Fi device off of that as well, two separate Wi-Fi devices. Would that be considered a separate network or does yes. it have to be two different modems and two different mm -hmm. connections? Yeah, that would be, th there's a couple ways that you could do it. And you're right, like I'm also a Spectrum customer. So for me, I have a, a, um, a cable router and then, all right, now it's a cable router combined with a, uh, I, I switch and it has wireless there. So um, then I have a separate wireless device that's connected to that. And that okay. actually, if you were to do that, oh, I'll just tell you, I, I use um, Eros that's like a mesh network. So I've got a mesh network at home that is connected to the uh, uh, wireless network from Spectrum. So if you were to take your IoT devices, connect them 
to the uh, spectrum device and then connect your computers and printers behind that on your Eero network or whatever. You then they would be network. separated. Yeah, that yeah. would be one way to okay. do it. Another okay. way you could do it is like, if you have a router that allows you to create two different networks, you call one guest, you know, okay. or, and then, so there's a couple of different ways you can do it. Yeah, okay, um, okay. This might fit in the category of, if you're not sure how to do that, um, find a, a friend or relative who does. Yeah, exactly. And be careful about that too, because some of your friends and relatives don't know as much as they say they know. <laughs> so be That's careful probably. with that. All right. We got another question that came in. Um, this one, this question says, I got an email the other day threatening to expose me for going to porn websites, which I have never done. Did I expose myself by opening the email? The mere act of opening the email, <clears throat> that uh, create uh, an exposure? Um, probably not. And uh, that's the closest I can come to, to saying whether, whether you did or not, but, but probably not. And here's, here's why there's um, emails, marketing emails. When, when you get a marketing email, they tend to know a lot about you and they'll actually know if you opened the message or not. Um, and the way that they do that is they put, it's called an invisible pixel. They'll put a, a tiny image file into the email. And then when you open up the email, it will go to the website to, to access that image file. And then that's how they track you. Now, the hacker in this case could have done something like that, but they usually don't in that specific case, the kind of that, that, um, uh, that, uh, porn ransom kind of thing. They're um, normally they're just it's just volume. It's just them pushing it out, trying to get somebody who uh, falls for the trick, and then contacts them. And so usually you haven't been exposed by that. Um, but so just opening up an email is normally pretty safe. There are a few cases where that's not true. But if you keep your web browsers and your um, operating systems up to date you won't have that much exposure to that. And of course, this is, a, this is a basic fraud. They're just arguably, they're probably just hoping to find somebody who views a lot of porn and will believe that that's actually what happened. Now, what they will sometimes do, and this is something to be aware of, is they'll hack, if they have stolen a password from somewhere, um, they will take that password and include it in the email. So the thing for you to be aware of is you may receive an email that says the proof that I've hacked your account is that I have your email address and your password. And they may literally send a password that you have used to you. And if you receive that, you could be like, I am super anxious, right? Because they just gave me a password that I actually have. That right. does not mean that you are out, uh, you know, I don't know, sleep porning or whatever you would, you, would happen there. <laughs> right. what, what's happening is, they are stealing your password from somewhere and then sending oh. it to you to make it more compelling. And this is something that a lot of folks just, we don't understand how, how the dark web works. And this is why Mike said earlier, it's so important for you to use a different password everywhere. So hackers are trying to break into every system they can all the time. When I talk about the way threats work, I say like the reason the reason we're able to use the internet at all is mostly because we don't understand how how risky it could be. But um, but what happens is like if you think about it, if you think about your house, right? Most of us, even if we live in a relatively safe neighborhood, and we might come home and unlock our doors and leave them unlocked until we go to bed, most of us lock our houses at night before we go to bed, even though the risk of somebody coming into our house at night is super low. You know, and so we lock our, our houses, but imagine that, <clears throat> imagine that when we got home from work, we drove up to our house and there were like a thousand people standing around your house and they all looked kind of, you know, shifty, like they maybe would like to come in and steal your TV. Like if that were the case, you'd actually, you'd keep driving. I, I don't know what you'd do, right? <laughs> it would be crazy yeah, exactly. because all these people around your house trying to get in. But that's kind of the way the internet is, right? And because you have these hackers all over the world who are trying to get into our networks and our computer systems, send us fishes all of the time. And so there's just a lot of threats out there. Well, one of the things that they'll do is they'll target websites 
and try to break into those websites. And when they do, they'll try to steal the passwords. Even if they're encrypted, they'll steal them and they'll crack them offline. And if you're using a short, an eight character password, then they can crack that eight character password no matter how complex it was in seconds. And so at that point, they've stolen your encrypted password and then they crack it really fast. And so once they crack that password, they now know what your password was at that website. That's why it's really important for you to have a different password at each one of your websites. Yeah, and it's then, really critical. Yeah, and so what you should be doing is like, you know, when we're done here, you should all go in and say, what's my most important accounts? And then you should say, what are my most important accounts where I'm using an eight character password? And for those, go and change them to something long. All right, I guess before that, get a password vault, password management software if you don't have it. And we, and and we should start. mention too that some of these password vault systems have free versions. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, where you can you know use them, download them to your computer, use them for free. Um, and it, it really is uh, helpful. Um, I don't like remembering passwords, so it's perfect for me. So no, they, yeah, they 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 are great, and you know, and and usually like like with mine by by paying for the this version of it, I can uh, um, I can uh, I can use the same passwords on my iPhone as on my Mac, and so you know some right. of the paid versions they're probably worth it. But you're right, there are free versions as well. But anyway, once you what you want to think Bye. about is if you use a core password, and a lot of people have like their most important accounts, they're all using the same password because that's the one that they remember. But all it takes is for a hacker to get into one of those and compromise them in one place. And then what they'll do is uh, they'll use a password spraying account where they basically go in and try a bunch of passwords, a bunch of different accounts. And so they'll take yeah. your stolen password and they'll try it wherever they can. And so that allows them to get into other accounts that you've got. Um, so you definitely have to, that's one of the reasons why she, having a different password everybody everywhere that you work is so super critical. Yeah, and it, it should go without saying, but it's really important, I think, to mention too, that two-factor authentication is very, very critical and important, and many, many places use it now. So um, you, uh, you know, most bank accounts now, if not all, have two-factor authentication, um, email, uh, has two-factor authentication, including Gmail, including um, Outlook, and all the all the major providers. They all have two-factor authentication. Uh, you know, as a business, we actually require two. If it's available, we have to have it. So it's. it's I think it's something that every user uh, should take advantage of. Two-factor is really uh, very important. Yeah. Oh, it is. It is absolutely important. And you know, when it comes to attacks that. Uh, target email accounts and and passwords. It is uh, it is the most important thing that you can do. So two factor authentication, which is you know if, I think probably you're all familiar with it in in one form or the other. But if you're not familiar with the term specifically, it's sometimes called multi factor authentication. Sometimes it's called like a two step authentication um, or two factor authentication. And what it is is it's a combination of something that you know something that you have or something that you are. So uh, something that you are could be like a biometric, like your fingerprint. Um, we don't do a lot of retina scanning in day-to-day in -day life, but, um, I, from a, but mostly when we do two-factor, we do something that we know, like a password, and then something that we have. And usually that thing that we have is actually our iPhone or our Android device. And so that is because we can either have a, a code texted to us, or we can have the code actually displayed on using uh, an app on your device. Um, yeah. And so for those of you who have read about it, there actually are some security risks having to do with text, uh, two-factor authentication codes being sent via text. So there are some attacks that can involve that. This kind of fits in the category of the better thing for you to do would be to use something like Google Authenticator or Microsoft's Authenticator or Authy, these apps yeah. that allow you to display a code on your on your phone. So, and I'm going to mention too here that as part of this uh, educational session, we are going to send out some resource information to the people that attended that will give you some some helpful links, um, and you can trust those links because they're coming from us. <laughs> as part of this presentation, to be expecting them. Um, but we'll put some helpful links in there. And like, there was one question here I'll answer right now. How do you get a password management software package? So we'll put some links in there for that. 
Um, that's a good question. And as far as authenticating uh, software, which we use here at Level, um, those are readily available in the app stores uh, for the Androids. Uh, Google Authenticator is one. We use Mintic uh, VIP. Authy is another one. And those are even more secure than the SMS because mm -hmm. they reside right on your phone um, and nobody's uh, sending you that information. It's right there and it's rotating. Um, we do have a couple other questions here I want to I want to throw in here uh, for you, Dave. So uh, this question says: Password protected websites offer the user the option of saving the password so that it doesn't have to be re-entered every time the site is visited. That's a convenience, but should the practice be avoided? I know what my answer is, but I'm gonna wait for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm gonna say. Um... If you do not have um, a, if you don't have password management software, that would be better than nothing. So it would be better to do that than to use, uh, to reuse passwords. Um, but what you should generally do, and so usually incidentally when that's happening, it's actually not the website that's doing the, uh, remembering the password, it's actually your browser. browser. Yeah. So it's like, it's Safari or, uh, Google Chrome or Firefox or Edge or you know whatever browser you use. Um, so each of those browsers has a capability. And so from that perspective, what the browser manufacturers recognize is it is it's better to do that than than nothing. So that that way they can inc and they're really doing that to encourage you to use different passwords and to to, to store them securely. Um, but uh, Broadly, what you should be doing instead is disabling that feature in your browsers or not using it and then using password management software. So yeah, so um, that's another thing that we do at level is we, we disable that function on our, on our browsers, the ability to remember passwords, the ability to, and, and the, one of the reasons is obviously is that if your computer gets compromised, or your network gets compromised and somebody gains mm -hmm. access to the computer. Now what you've done is you've given them access to important things that are on your computer because the password's remembered. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah. Dangerous. dangerous. Right. Oh, and you know, so so one thing about the, the password management software though is many of those, many of the products actually do have plugins for your browser. So yeah. um, in and, and what will happen is they'll have this plugin that runs, but when you start up your browser, you have to authenticate when you start up the browser. Um, so as it turns out, that integration with your browser makes them super easy to use. So yep. they, they're they actually, once you get the hang of it, you'll find that it's a really easy tool to use, um, but you should be using that instead of the built-in the, the built um, password saving that's built in your browser. Right, right. Okay, here's another question. It's a good question. How often, should we quote unquote flush our system when it comes to things like caches and temporary files and things like that? What's a good practice there? Um, you know, there's not a there's not a ton of security to to this kind of to, to that point of it. So it's probably more of a performance thing than it is a, a security thing. But what I would say is this: if you are backing up your system every week then that might be a good time to do it. Um, you know, in the old days, we couldn't run our computers for very long before uh, they would just bog down and we had to reboot them anyway. Um, but these days, our computers probably stay up and run just fine for a long time. Um, and the memory management is actually uh, great compared to what it was like when I started in IT. So, right. um, at that, you know, the, there is a point though, where if you think about it in terms of like saved settings, all right, so this is probably a case where it would make sense is if you're doing, if you're going to password management software, that would be a great time for you to clear your cookies and clear anything that you have on your, um, on your browser that are saved settings for like uh, saved passwords. So that would be a and good- Good chance to and do there's it. There's settings on browsers too, where you can actually have it clear automatically uh, over certain time periods too, right? You can have it every time you close the browser, you could have it clear it if you wanted to. Yeah, that is true. And you know, cookies are this the one thing where, um, when you think about that, clearing those periodically might make sense, um, particularly if you're concerned about how good they are at 
realizing, you know, what you were just shopping for on Amazon uh, or searching for in Google be because of that. But, um, you know, if, and if you get to the point where you really are concerned about how much your, uh, the internet seems to know about you, you could also look at uh, browsers like DuckDuckGo, um, which are actually really good at protecting your privacy. So that's, the, I'm glad you brought, the, brought up the duck, duck, go, because you're hearing a lot of advertising for that now. And, and, and they're advertising, hey, you know, it's a privacy thing. It's completely free in, in 30 seconds or less. How does, how does duck, duck, go make their money? Like, what, what are they doing um, th that allows them to, to offer this and advertise all over the place? <laughs> uh, you know, I actually, I don't know where their money comes from, but they wouldn't be the first organization that has uh, has been set up as a nonprofit um, and takes donations to develop a, a product. Are they a not profit then? They're not for profit? I do not know if they're not for profit yeah. or just, you know, just flying under the radar. That's that is a, yeah. that's a good question. But like if you think about um, if you think about Firefox, which is a pretty well established browser today, um, and uh, Mozilla uh, became Netscape, you know, um, so uh, the, there are a fair number of products that actually do start off as free. Um, one of the things that does happen with something like DuckDuckGo is you have to look at it and say, all right, well, how, what will they do next? And um, again, I, I actually, I'm not sure how the funding piece works for that. Typically what will happen with a company like that is if they're going to stay, you know, because of their mission, they're probably going to do like a premium product that has extra features that they charge for. Right, right. Okay, good. Someone, someone did. Uh, your colleague Lori just chimed in and said DuckDuckGo is not a nonprofit. There you go. So, there you go. <laughs> okay, thank you, Lori. All right. Um, another quick question here, and this one I may, may be a little bit difficult to answer because it sounds like there could be a lot of a lot of things here. Um, we we have recently had our laptop totally blocked, so we could not log off. Uh, sounds like that computer is compromised. Um, how do we deal with this? I mean, what I was first thing I would say is shut the thing off, <laughs> like turn the power off if you can't even log out of your computer because it seems like it's under control. Yeah, yeah. So definitely, like if you have a situation where uh, you cannot get uh, anything else to happen, like again, a, a hard reset is the way that the, that you'd probably tackle that. Uh, like with a the Mac, there, you know, if you take the power button and hold it down for long enough it'll shut down. Same thing with your iPhones. And, um, uh, and so you have a same, similar feature on most devices that is just- And, and, that, hap and that works in Windows too. If you hold the power button down on most CPUs, it'll shut off. And then yeah. you hit it again, it'll come back up. Now, if it comes back up and you still can't control your computer, then obviously you have a major issue and you would probably, uh, first of all, take it off the, take it off the internet. <laughs> And second of all, get it to a computer expert, I'm assuming. Right. Yeah. I mean, that would be the, the thing that would happen, you know, for us on the corporate side, our approach would be to say, look, shut that computer down, bring it to us, take another computer and give it to the, to the person who needs to get online. Um, but most of us don't have spare computers at home that we're going to use uh, to replace the one that we need to, to take to a forensics expert. Um, but yeah, it's like, you you do have to be concerned about um, a device that has gotten to the point where it appears to be fully taken over. Now, sometimes right. sometimes it's a hardware problem. You know, sometimes it's not a it's not really a hacker. But unfortunately, at this point, you kind of have to assume that it is. Right. So let's let's finish with this. I know we're it's, it's seven o'clock here. And there's one other topic we wanted to get to real quick. I think we can probably hit it uh, pretty fast. So. In your experience, what are some of the telltale signs that your computer has been compromised in some way, whether it be adware, malware, virus, what are some of the telltale signs? Yeah, so I guess one of the cases is it's locked up and you can't log off. So, um, but other than that, uh, what I think, uh, so one of the things is your mouse starts moving. So if you see your mouse moving when I, uh, it shouldn't be, then that's an indication. Um, I, uh, uh, and then a, a, and I actually had a, had a problem with mine recently where uh, my, one of 
I, I started getting a D key when I was not pressing a D key. And it turned out that something had fallen on my wireless network. So the first thing you want to do in, in that case is check to see if there's a cat on your keyboard or something like that. Right. But if you start to see keystrokes or your mouse moving when you don't expect it to, then that can be an indication uh, that somebody is working on your computer. If you step away from your computer, come back, and there are new windows that have appeared uh, or windows open and close, that could be an issue. If you start, if you're in your browser and you start seeing a lot of different pop-ups all within your browser, that usually means that you have adware on the computer. So um, in that case, there, what you would want to do is to go into your browser and check for um, extensions that have been installed. It can be really tough to get out of that situation, but you have to remove extensions, extra software that can be installed. Um, so it can take some time just to clean up that. Um, mm -hmm. You could also look for a system that's, that reboots when you don't expect it to. Um, another clue actually can be a fan that keeps running. So if your fan is just worrying all the time, then that can be an indication that uh, you might have a hacker who's actually using this, using your computer to run uh, like a crypto mining. And so they're actually using the computer without you being able to see it. Yeah, that's an interesting one. The, the, the CPU fan in the back of your computer that's constantly running, especially if you're not doing anything on the computer, like all your programs are closed and maybe you got one thing open and the thing's constantly running. That could be an indicator that somebody's using that CPU or something else that you don't want it to. Right. Um, and uh, that probably requires expert help to take a look at. There is one question that came in while we were talking here. Um, it's a good question. How reliable are scanning applications which check for malware? So um, how reliable or maybe even how effective are they in, um, I mean, we use software, we use antivirus mm -hmm. and a, a software called Malware Byte. In your opinion, how effective are these um, malware softwares? Yeah, so not 100% is the important thing for all of us to remember. Um, there was an attack against the New York Times, and this has been a number of years ago, but um, uh, it was an attack by uh, many people think that it was a foreign government that was uh, unhappy with some of the Times reporting. But um, what, what they ended up doing is uh, they, they targeted them with, I want to say it was 43 different types of malware. And the antivirus software for the New York Times caught one of them. And so that's a great example that kind of helps us to understand how limited antivirus can be, which doesn't mean that it's not important. It's a defense, but it's not the only defense that you can have. One of the problems is that malware tends to be really good at spotting attacks that it knows about and less good at attacking uh, or at spotting attacks that it doesn't recognize. Right. So right. you absolutely need it. And I run it on my Macs. I run it um, throughout throughout the company and it, on my my home computers. But um, you can't rely on it. It's just one right. piece of your defenses. Okay. So we'll include some resources about the different types of softwares that are out there when we send out the recording. So I think, I think what we'll do is we'll wrap up here. I mean, it was a good informational hour. Dave, I wanna thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to, to talk with our folks here. And um, for everybody that uh, joined the session, we'll make sure you get the recording. We'll make it available here in the next couple of days. Um, I guess until next time, everybody have a, a wonderful evening. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, great talking to you. Okay. Take care.